Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I'm delighted to welcome you here this morning for an important conversation. Um, and I also want to welcome everybody who's joining us on Facebook. Uh, you can tweet questions for us uh, during the audience Q&A using the hash hashtag Ernst Iraq USIP. Um, as many of you know, USIP was founded by Congress in 1984 uh, as an independent, nonpartisan federal institution uh, dedicated to reducing violent international conflicts that pose a threat to U.S. national security. And we do this by working in conflict zones around the world, providing partners with the tools, the approaches, and the training so that they can manage conflict so it doesn't become violent and resolving it when it does. And we also host conversations like this here in our Washington Global Headquarters on critical policy issues of the day. Um, so this morning, we are honored to host Senator Joni Ernst um, to join us this morning to discuss U.S. policy options following the defeat of ISIS in Iraq. Senator Ernst brings true frontline knowledge to this issue. She served as a company commander in Kuwait and Iraq. Uh, she led over 150 Army National Guardsmen during Operation Iraq Freedom in 2003, and she retired as a lieutenant colonel in the Iowa Army National Guard after 23 years of service. Last fall, Senator Ernst led a bipartisan congressional delegation to Iraq where she met with U.S. troops and senior military and diplomatic leaders in the uh, region. She's been a leader on these kinds of discussions focused on stabilizing Iraq and meeting the challenges of evolving global threats. Um, in her role, both as a member of the Armed Services Committee and as chair of the Armed Services Subcommittee on Emerging Threat and Capabilities. She is the kind of leader we want and need uh, in Congress today. And so we'll have a chance to hear her thoughts on how to sustain the military gains we already have made in Iraq once again at this pivotal post-ISIS moment. Um, this is an important topic for us here at USIP. We're especially pleased we can have this conversation today as it is one of our priority countries. We've been there continuously since 2003, working to strengthen the institutions and communities in their efforts to resolve conflicts. Um, and I had a chance to see our USIP programs in February when I traveled there with our board chair, uh, Stephen Hadley, who's here with us today. And we met with partners from our network of Iraqi facilitators who we've supported and trained for over a decade. And together, a decade ago, in Mahmoudia, known as the Triangle of Death, we helped broker a peace agreement at the request of the U.S. military between Su Sunni and Shia leaders um, that at the time stopped violence and lasted for a decade and helped that community withstand um, uh, ISIS when it overran Iraq. And more recently, we focused our efforts with those same facilitators on supporting peace agreements uh, in areas that have been liberated from ISIS, and these have enabled uh, more than half a million Iraqis to return home. We also visited Nineveh Plains, where we partner and support the Alliance of Iraqi Minorities, uh, which advocates for political and social inclusion of religious uh, and ethnic minorities like the Christians, the Shabak, the Yazidis, who are fighting to regain their lives and their communities after the brutal ISIS occupation. Um, but in our conversations throughout the country, we heard how fragile the country it still is and how the security threats persist. So we applaud congressional leaders like Senator Ernst who are keeping these issues at the forefront of the national security dialogue. We look forward to her thoughts today on the challenges. And with that, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Senator Joni Ernst. Thank you, everybody, and, and thanks for the great introduction, too. I, I really appreciate it, and it's it's good to be amongst so many friends, and, and thank you again. Um, 
I appreciate the opportunity to talk about, obviously, uh, a topic that's Im important to me, which is U.S. policy in Iraq. Uh, as many of you know, uh, and as we just heard, I did spend time in Iraq as a National Guardsman, Iowa Army National Guard, and I deployed to Iraq where my company provided logistical convoys from Kuwait on up into Iraq. And I can vividly remember those days. The the, the sounds, the smells, um, the feel of the sandstorms coming in. And that experience instilled in me a desire to facilitate peace and prosperity in that region that has been so devastated by war for um, so many decades. During our operations, women and children would often come up to our trucks as we were pushing up into Iraq, and they would literally beg for help. They would come to us seeking water or oftentimes food. And many of my, my soldiers would get very upset about the fact that we could not give them water or food. And as we told our, our soldiers, because if you start handing food or water out the windows of your trucks in a convoy, you will bring more. They, if you have it and you give it, they will come. And understanding then that uh, we had to stay in our vehicles, we couldn't hand out food, um, we had to continue the mission. The more people that get into the roadways and into those villages, into those areas, the greater um, our uh, our vul vulnerabilities would be out on the road. Um, so as we experienced that, and it was especially some of my younger mothers, too, that had left children back at home. When they saw young children that were hurting or that were hungry, they wanted to stop. The American soldier is drawn to stop and assist, and we were not able to do that because of our own vulnerabilities. Um, we did not want to be at risk of ambush or attack. Now, in my current role as a United States Senator from Iowa, I am working to be part of a solution to the needs of the Iraqi people who desire to live in a prosperous nation. They want that, um, separate from the devastation and the humanitarian crisis that still plagues the country. Following the declared defeat of ISIS in December of 2017, the U.S. must now find ways to support Iraq's development as a free and democratic society, while also ensuring that Iraq has the training and resources necessary to defeat any reemergence of ISIS or any similar type terrorist organization. We also need to work with our international partners to ensure the safety and well-being of the religious and ethnic minorities who have suffered the greatest burden of the violence in Iraq. And finally, the U.S. must work with Iraqi institutions to prevent Iran from poisoning the Iraqi transition to fit their regional goals rather than those of the United States or of Iraq. Our first and our highest priority must be to ensure that the Iraqi government has the equipment and the training to conduct sustained and resilient counterterrorism operations. As we saw during the height of ISIS's gains in Iraq, our efforts and those of the international community failed to prepare the Iraqi security forces to defend themselves adequately against ISIS. Reports and footage of Iraqi security forces abandoning U.S. provided arms and vehicles in their retreat from ISIS should serve as a reminder that unless we are confident in Iraq's capacity and ability to defend themselves, U.S. presence in Iraq will remain necessary to protect our interests. The consensus to date is that the U.S. train, advise, and assist mission has taken the lessons learned from the rise of ISIS and the Iraqi forces being trained today are considered much more capable than those that we saw trained in 2012.
And as a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee and the chairman of the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee, I've worked with my colleagues to provide consistent resources for this mission. Now that ISIS violence levels are down to their lowest level since the U.S. pulled out of Iraq, we must buckle down and continue to bolster Iraqi security forces rather than becoming complacent and seeing some of the mistakes of the past. Secondly, we must ensure that our stabilization efforts in Iraq do not overlook the most vulnerable and highest impacted communities, which are those religious and ethnic minorities. Rather than providing blanket stability funding to Iraq, I believe that the U.S. should, in fact, prioritize aid to those who have been most affected by food shortages, violence, and persecution. To accomplish this, the U.S. must work with groups and partners, such as the U.S. Institute of Peace, thank you so much, uh, who have the relationships and the access that's necessary to reach into those communities and areas that are still being plagued by violence. The reality of the situation in Iraq is that some U.S. diplomatic and government personnel are unable to travel around the country due to security concerns. If we ever hope to support marginalized groups in Iraq, we must improve our ability to move throughout the country so that we can reach those groups and provide the services necessary for them to prosper. To this end, I would like to commend the current administ administration, especially kudos to uh, Vice President Mike Pence for pushing the United Nations to increase funding to these minority groups. Additionally, I support the administration's efforts to provide direct relief to these groups through USAID rather than waiting for the UN and others. It is clear that Vice President Pence and others are committed to bringing these desperate people relief. And I will continue to use my position in Congress to facilitate uh, to facilitate these efforts. Now, the final point I would like to discuss is the need to counter Iranian influence in Iraq's government institutions. There is a, a school of thought out there that because the U.S. and Iran both seek to defeat ISIS, that our strategic interests are therefore aligned in Iraq. And I categorically reject um, that premise, as we have seen Iran's true regional goals in Syria and through their support for terrorist organizations that have killed United States and allied personnel across the Middle East. And we need to look no further than the constant Iranian call of death to America to realize that we are not and will never be strategically aligned with the Ayatollah regime. Iran's goal is to manipulate Iraqi development to allow its extremist fighters and weapons to have better access to Iraq and Syria, where they can continue to support undemocratic governments such as the Assad regime. Iran's strategic goals would be significantly hindered by a free and prosperous prosperous Iraq with, a, with their strong Western allies, which is reason alone for the United States to continue countering these efforts. To do this, the United States must remain a partner of choice for Iraq as it develops into a young democracy. We must continue to provide the Iraqi government, as well as U.S.-aligned groups in Iraq, with the necessary security assistance and aid for them to transition into a prosperous nation that supports U.S. principles and values. So if we are giving up our hope or turning our backs on Iraq, they will seek help elsewhere. We have already seen Iraq look to Russia for some of their military equipment, which is counter to our goal of limiting Putin's influence over our allies. While there have been instances of U.S. arms falling into the wrong hands, and the U.S. should make every effort to prevent those occurrences, Iraq will see the, seek this aid regardless of our willingness to provide it. 
when we provide this aid rather than our adversaries, we are more able to ensure that the employment of those articles is in line with our standards of combat. And to conclude, I would like to reemphasize that our top priority in Iraq should be to bolster the Iraqi security forces' capacity to stamp out any reemergence of ISIS or the rise of any similar terrorist organization in Iraq. Our greatest security interest in the region is to defeat terrorist organizations before they gain the capability to project attacks against the United States. For decades, U.S. service members have risked their lives to protect the freedoms that we hold so dear. And during my own deployment, there were even, and I, I love this, but there were even Iowa Army National Guard cooks that volunteered to join our logistical convoys as drivers in order to contribute to our overall cause. And we owe it to those men and women, especially the ones who have given the ultimate sacrifice, as well as our Iraqi partners, to complete the transition of Iraq into a prosperous and democratic society. While there is still much to be accomplished, I am confident that our will to succeed is greater than our enemy's desire to see us fail. Again, I want to thank you very much for allowing me to be here, and I look forward to our question and answer session. So thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Now we're <laughs> Okay, fantastic. In that chair. Thank you again for joining us. Um, oh, my pleasure. Thanks great to Nancy. have you here. Um, and I'm going to take the prerogative of asking you a few questions before we open it up uh, to our uh, audience. Um, and I want to start, you mentioned several times the importance of um, working to train and equip the Iraqi. Yes. Army. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned, of course, what we saw happen at, at the beginning of the ISIS right. uh, invasion. Um, what gives you faith that we'll be able to do so differently this time and, and leave a stronger Iraqi army behind? Well, I, I do think through the train, advise, and assist mission, we have come a long way. And we have taken through, through our after action reviews, we have taken some valuable lessons learned. So the Iraqis truly do want to do better. And I think that's key to their success is um, just that, that they have that desire to overcome now. And they have seen the leadership coming from the United States for many years now. So we are seeing those, um, those forces that are, are coming up, having witnessed American leadership and gained knowledge from it. And now they are in positions where they can project that strength forward. So I do think that we need to continue pressing very hard with those trained, advised, and assist missions. Um, it's not something that we can let go. But we are starting to see some of that leadership develop throughout those ranks. And I think that that will be key in the future. Um, so many times I've heard from uh, different units or different organizations that are doing the train, advise, and assist um, missions that at first they were very hesitant unless they had an American that was with them leading whatever activity they were engaged in. Now the Americans are able to just truly do that advise portion, and they are letting their Iraqi counterparts really provide the leadership necessary. So uh, again, we have to push very hard in that area, but I think we've come quite a long ways in, in the past five or so years. We heard, when Steve and I were there, we heard from a number of uh, Iraqis that there was a sense that th their military, that the Iraqis had played um, uh, uh, a strong role towards the end of the defeat of ISIS. Mm -hmm. um, does that does that give a different runway for working off of base of confidence? Right. Um, I was going to. You said confidence. I was going to say empowerment. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly, once you start to see success, you feel success. Um, you see yourself as a successful leader. And so, again, developing those uh, those fighters through the ranks 
as they uh, develop their skills and, and rise up into those leadership positions, you will continue to see more of that. That is what we are hoping for. Um, but again, we have, we have to keep our, our foot on the gas pedal with the train advice and assist mm -hmm. mission. This is not something that I think that, that we can back off on right now. Um, at some point, I think there's a lot of folks out, um, just we were talking a little bit ago about across America, what are people saying? Uh, there is a bit of weariness when it comes to whether it's Iraq or, or Afghanistan, but we have a role to play there. And we do not want to see what we saw occur with the rise of ISIS. Um, we, cannot, we cannot afford that. And you alluded to this in your speech, Iraq is in a tough neighborhood. There's a lot going on. Yes. And so what do you see in terms of you know, critical issues in the region that affect our interests and also affect Iraq's mm -hmm. ability to move forward? Well, I, I think there's the, the typical discussions of Syria and so forth. But I would say, um, from my perspective, too, another area that we really need to spend some more time on and in a really solid uh, discussion is the issue of Turkey. Um, I have had some, some issues. I know others will as well, understanding that Turkey should be uh, a close ally of ours. They are an ally, but they're supposed to be an ally. <laughs> um, so it, it is very tough when, when you see Erdogan holding Americans prisoner in what is an allied nation. Um, we look at Andrew Brunson, Pastor Brunson was just on, on the news. He's been released under house arrest now, so that's a step forward. But the fact that he has been imprisoned for so long is a serious issue that, that should be dealt with. Um, so there's so many, uh, so many other issues, whether they are attempting to purchase Russia-made military equipment uh, that doesn't work with NATO equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, there are just so many issues there that are complicating that region even more. Um, and I go back, the issues I have with Turkey, going back to when I deployed. Uh, when I was a young Iowa Army National Guard captain, my power projection platform for my transportation company was Turkey. And for those of you that remember going back to 2003, um, Turkey denied the United States the ability to use their country as a power projection platform. And so because of that, then my company ended up rerouted into Kuwait, where there were thousands and thousands and thousands of other Americans waiting to get up into Iraq because they were supposed to go through Turkey too. And so we had this backlog of movement trying to get into Iraq. and. It, it was a very difficult time because Turkey didn't want to enable the assault into Iraq. So it increases the stakes in Iraq. Yes, it does. Given all of these multiple influences, you of course mentioned Iran uh, mm -hmm. as a competitor for Iraqi interests mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and that's a really difficult situation as well when we talk about our, our big adversaries. Iran is one of those, um, one of the top uh, countries that we will look at. And they complicate the issue as well. And I don't have much good to say about Iran as well. I mean, it's, it's just really very complicated, and you throw in a little bit of Russian influence too, and it's very complicated. And that's one of the issues that uh, we were discussing earlier, how we have, we used to have Rex Tillerson as the Secretary of State. We have Secretary Mattis at the Department of Defense, and um, we would have Dan Coates come in and, and talk intelligence. And they would give briefings in the skiff under the Capitol. And they talked about so many of the different relationships that exist in that region and how you have so certain countries aligned with other countries, but they are not friends of this country. And Secretary Mattis, he said, you find that um, your enemy one day is your 
partner the next? And he said it is extremely complicated and it is ever changing. Um, you, you mentioned, of course, um, the difficulty of the religious minorities mm -hmm. in Iraq. And we have going on this week, uh, the uh, US hosted yes. ministerial on international religious freedom. Uh, where this is among the many topics being discussed. Uh, what, what do you see as the priority assistance that we can and should provide um, to help the Christians, the Shabak and the Yazidis, and the Yazidis. Try, to, try to gain, I mean, it's a, mm -hmm. talk about complexity. It's a terribly complex mm -hmm. and, and heartbreaking situation. It is, and, and that's why we do have to rely on international partners as well. I think that that is very important. And then other organizations that we have, our non-governmental organizations that can go in and provide that assistance. Um, pushing the UN, I think, is very important, and that's why I said kudos to the Vice President mm -hmm. for engaging in that discussion, because it was absolutely necessary. We just can't throw a blanket of money at a country and expect that money to get into the populations that need it the most. So when you're talking about those per persecuted minorities, um, we have to ensure that they are getting the medical supplies, they are getting the food necessary, that they have clean water. Um, all of that is required. We just have to make sure they get that. Hmm. Um, so uh, working like with folks at USAID and, and others, I think that uh, is the best way to do that. And of course, Mark Green, the aid yes, administrator, right. was just yes. over there. Yes. Um, one final question, then we're going to open it up. But um, when Steve Hadley and I were over there, we heard from a tribal sheikh who leaned over and said, you know, we've won the war three times now. What do we need to do to win the peace? Oh, gosh. Um, and so the question is, how do you answer that question? What do we need to do? <laughs> and the three wars being well, the Saddam, Saddam the, the, yes. the awakening, I, and then ISIS. Al Qaeda and ISIS. Yeah. So yes. we fought. The military has fought in one right. three times. Right. And again, it's so difficult because they have so many different ethnic minorities and different religious groups uh, across Iraq. But we can't win the peace for them. And I think that's the key to any region where we're engaged. We can't want it more than they do. And so we have to build or foster that desire with the Iraqi people to find peace. Mm -hmm. And we can help them collaborate as groups. We can foster discussion amongst groups. We can provide guidance. But we can't, we cannot do it for them. Um, if we are doing it for them, we won't see a lasting peace. So that's why with the, going back to the train, advise, and assist missions, it's all well and good if you have an American soldier that is leading the charge, but the Iraqis are not learning the leadership unless they're actually engaging as a leader in that charge. So we really do need to, to bring them together, help them collaborate, guide that discussion, but it ultimately is up to them. And it takes a much longer time than most Americans imagine, right. which is one of the challenges, of course, right. the time horizon Absolutely. for the kind of change. Um, I, I'm going to open it up for questions. We have a couple of mic runners. Um, and runners. Yeah. We'll, we'll start right there and then go to Kurt, secondly. Good morning. Thank Good you for morning. doing this. My name is Rafael Salido from FN News. I wanted to know your opinion with the recent elections. Now you have Muqtadar al Sadr. Do you think that the situation has changed there? Because, I mean, in the past he was not precisely mm -hmm. friend of the U.S. Mm -hmm. That's how it's going to change things there. Thank but you. The, well, well, we, we still wait for their... Y yes, <laughs> and uh, time, time will tell. And no, uh, not exactly a friend to the United States. Um, however, 
we do have to continue working with the established government. Once once everyone is in, in place, we continue working. That's the way we are as the United States. We have our objectives within Iraq. We need to make sure that those are fulfilled. That means working with whoever the Iraqi people have elected, whether it's our choice or not. If that's who they have elected, we will work with them. Um, again, because we can't afford just to step back from this such situation. As Nancy said, this is going to take a long time. And I think back to when we first went into Iraq in 2003, uh, a lot of the soldiers that were there with me had also deployed for Desert Storm. Desert Storm was a very quick in and out conflict war, okay? And what we saw going into Iraq in 2003 was very different. Um, so there was a preconceived notion that this is going to be quick and easy, it's going to be over with, la di da. Um, but those older, wiser, more senior members of our military said, and at that time they had said, we'll be here a decade. Well, <laughs> we've been there 15 years now. So um, we have a long ways to go yet, uh, but we will work with whoever is in place. We have to. Can, can I just note, I mean, we, it really does feel like a different moment uh, in terms of the Iraqis' own desire to forge peace in right. their country. Your comment that we can't want it more than they do, but when they do want it, our support Ab is more important Absolutely. than ever. Absolutely, and, and that is key because um, now that they are tasting uh, tasting that little bit of peace, they do have people that are advancing into leadership within their own forces. Um, they are able to take ownership of their situation, and that's what has to happen in order to be successful. Uh, we are getting there. Are we there yet? We are not there yet. And the weariness that we are experiencing, just as we were talking, sitting in the Senate Armed Services uh, Committee through our meetings, People are asking, when are we going to get out of Iraq? When are we going to get out of Afghanistan? We've been there too long. What, what gains are we seeing? Um, under, understood, I get that. Uh, we have expended a lot of lives in Iraq, but we can't just let go and expect that all will be well and the United States will not be another target at some point in the future. Uh, Kurt. Uh, Senator uh, Kurt Volker, uh, Executive Director of the McCain Institute and a member of Nancy's International Advisory Board. And? And, uh, and a special representative for Ukraine negotiations. Oh, outstanding. But I'm not going to ask you about Ukraine. <laughs> 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 I actually want to come to um, uh, just what you were talking about, uh, which I think is a critically important thing. First, thank you for your service and your leadership and for the position that you're taking, uh, which is articulating a very strong case for robust American leadership uh, to address an issue that is of critical importance to our country and also globally. Um, but what I'm curious about is how do you see the trends in the American public? Uh, is that a position that you can sell to people? Can you explain to people? Um, can you sustain support for that? Can we all do that? Because I, I do believe it's critically important, but I think we're we're facing a time, and and I, I'll even say, even you know, particularly within the Republican Party, we're sustaining that level of international leadership and commitment is getting difficult. Mm -hmm. You're right, and we just had this discussion before we entered the room about what what does the American public think, and what are we hearing, and it. It used to be a time, especially when I first entered the United States Senate, because we saw the, eyes, uh, the rise of ISIS, it was on everybody's minds. But now that we have seen ISIS um, pushed out of Iraq, now the public's not talking about it. How many of you have heard media stories in the last couple of days about Iraq? Just a couple folks. 
um, what we're hearing is trade and tariffs and the EU and NATO meetings and Putin meetings and and so we're not focused on on where we are engaging our troops and and that does disturb me because if we don't have the support of the American people those of us that are elected to represent those folks back home we're not going to put the emphasis on it either so every night I get a tally sheet of what people are calling in about and from each of my Iowa offices as well as what they're calling in about at my DC office and I review that I can't remember the last time I saw somebody call in or talk to me about Iraq for I'll or against for or against not it's just not it's it's not the topic of conversation right now uh, I bet you could walk out in, into the streets here in Washington, D.C. and just ask random Joe on the street, hey, do you know we still have troops in Iraq? And they'd probably be like, no, we're not there. <laughs> so um, so it, it's really difficult for those of us uh, that serve in the Senate to continue supporting when we're not hearing that level of support coming from back home and therefore the, the weariness. Why are we spending so much money there when it's not a top priority for our constituents? It's why those of us that see that bigger picture and the global impact, it's why we have to communicate with those other members why it is so important. Because we're not hearing it from constituents, we're not hearing about it through the media. Uh, so it does make our job harder. But as I said uh, before we came in, I said in, in Iowa, we have a very high percentage of, of veterans. Hmm. Um, we have nearly 7% of our population are veterans in Iowa. And we have no active duty installations. We have reservists and National Guardsmen. And then we have the, the active duty folks that will leave Iowa and go somewhere else to serve. Um, but we have those members in every community. And so when you talk to people in the communities, they're familiar with the war in Iraq. They know someone who has served in Iraq. They get it, but we're just not talking about it. And we need to do more of that. Um, the mic is coming right there. Hi, um, Ongi Baki from the Council on Foreign Relations and Lehigh University. Senator, we talk about a post-ISIS Iraq, but in fact, ISIS is still very much there. And in fact, last week there was a big article in the Washington Post about how the road between Kirkuk and Baghdad is not safe, um, right? Because ISIS is essentially blocking very often, and people have to fly instead of driving. And, but ISIS is not just an Iraq problem, it's a regional problem. And in fact, my question really has to do with the administration's policy or the White House's policy with respect to ISIS. Because on the one hand, we have troops in Syria fighting ISIS, and, and the president wants to pull them out, and he actually would like to have pulled them out months ago, if it wasn't for General Mattis. So what would you be your advice in terms of um, to the administration and whether or not you would like to push back the administration in terms of being much more active in terms of fighting ISIS? Because if you pull the troops out of Syria, ISIS is going to come back. Right. And, ISIS is, and the thing about ISIS is like it's, it's a virus. It will spread. And if you don't keep the pressure on that's them, uh, th that's what they will do. Yeah, and that is a great way to describe it. And I would say that we do have to push back on the administration. And it's, it's not just with ISIS. It's, you know, pulling troops out of South Korea. I think there's just so many instances of we want to bring our men and women home. And, and that's great. I would support that as well. <laughs> you know, I'd love, I'd love to have a peaceful world. Um, but we know that's not true. So we have declared uh, victory over ISIS in Iraq, but we still know that they exist. Many of them have just dismantled. They have, uh, they have gone back into general population. So it's almost like what we would call whack-a-mole. Um, one pops up here, you slap them back down, and then another one pops up over here. And that's why we have to have that continued train advice and assist mission in Iraq, because we have to be there. We have to assist with that leadership. 
Um, we have to make sure that ISIS doesn't redevelop. And I think your description of ISIS being like a virus is spot on. It is perfect uh, in how we should be describing ISIS, because the minute you take your eyeball off of it, it is going to multiply. And you are right. So in Syria, ISIS is a big issue. And that's why we have our American men and women in that region in Syria and fighting. Um, the president, again, would, as you said, would love to pull them out of Syria. And that is not feasible. That is not feasible. And Secretary Mattis does have the president's ear, and I'm very thankful that, that the president does listen to that. Uh, he does listen to the secretary. And so we still have troops there. Um, we will continue to push against that. I think those of us that understand how volatile the situation could be if we pull our, our troops out, uh, we will continue to be pressing very hard to make sure they, they remain. Um, so thank you. It's a, it's a great point. And of course, Senator, as you mentioned earlier, it's the, it's the military plus other mm. capabilities. of NGOs and, and others and international partners. Yeah, that's uh, right here. Thank you for being here today, Senator. Uh, Charlie Rogan, Artist International. Uh, in our research outside of Mosul, uh, two weeks after the East Bank had been cleared, we actually found among Sunni Arabs that uh, the Kurds and the Peshmerga were the most respected. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about how today there seems to be a different climate in Iraq and the officer corps and the NCOs seem you know, more likely and more determined to actually carry out their mission. What do you think's changed from today compared with 2011? Well, again, I think it's it's the leadership opportunities that have been afforded. Um, but the Kurdish Peshmerga, and just from from my experience and and those that I have worked with, are are very highly respected, and they will always be highly respected. They have been such great partners to our U.S. servicemen and women. Um, but. I, I do think it's the leadership opportunity and the fact that they have been able to grow in their ranks, um, develop those young officers and NCOs, as you stated. They have had the opportunity to serve in those positions now. They know their tasks. It's just like any young NCO or officer in our armed armed forces. The more you are rehearsing, the more you are completing a task, the better you are going to be at that task. Um, and the way I, and I should have described this earlier, but leadership, when you define leadership, the way the Army, the United States Army defines leadership, uh, or a leader, is someone who can inspire others towards a common goal or objective for the good of the organization or the unit. That's a leader. And so the fact that uh, we now have those in roles where they can inspire others to follow them, follow their example, um, they are becoming a much, a much better force. Thank you. Senator, we have a question from Facebook. Wow. Uh, asking. Uh, what is the threat Technology. presented uh, by the Iranian forces present in Iraq, and is there anything we can do to remove them? Well, we need to keep pushing against the Iranians, and their threat is, no matter where they are, there is a threat. Um, they enable the killing of so many U.S. service members um, during our time in Iraq through the development of IEDs and other types of, of bombs and, and so forth. Um, they want Americans gone. They want Americans gone. And that poses a security risk, a stability risk to Iraq because their interests are not our interests in Iraq. And so what is the ultimate path forward in getting uh, the Iranians out of Iraq? I can't detail that to you today. And again, it goes back to that interesting web that Secretary Mattis was trying to describe to us and who's partners with who and, and who's the adversary of who. And it, it just becomes extremely complicated. But, you know, as I always say, Russia is, is not our friend. Iran is not our friend either. Um, we have a question over here. <laughs> Hello, uh, Laura Kelly from The Washington Times. Yeah, Thank you for being Laura. with us today. 
Um, I think what we saw in the fight against ISIS was this unprecedented unity among the Iraqi forces, and they did gain a great deal of skill with the train and assist program from the U.S. and international partners. But I think now what we're seeing is they're taking that leadership and skill, and they are coming into their own groups, and they're separating, and they're protecting their own interests. And of course, Iran is involved in this as well, with the Shia militias. So how, what is the role of the U.S. continuing going forward in promoting unity right. um, and also balancing all of these different self-interests? And absolutely. And that's um, why we were talking earlier about the collaboration and the leadership that needs to be provided by the United States, whether it's through our military organizations or through other non-governmental organizations and international partnerships. We have to be the ones fostering the discussion amongst the different groups. Uh, it is really important that we are leading the discussion. And again, we can't solve the issue for them. They have to find that path forward and take ownership of their own destiny. Again, they have to want it um, more than, than we want it. So um, it is really providing, providing the, the necessary steps to work forward in a, in a discussion and working with those groups. Uh, well, that, that is a discussion that I think in a debate that would need to happen up the hill. Um, there, there, again, are just so many different interests involved. And so whether it's promising arms to a certain group or deciding not to arm a certain group, those are some of the discussions that, that we can have. Um, and then there can be other discussions with our international partners as well. Um, so that's one method, carrot or stick. Um, but yes, we just have to be able to pull them together, though, and they, they have got to figure this out. They have got to figure this out. It quickly goes to the complexity that, you've, mm -hmm. that you continue to mention. Um, we'll take uh, two final questions here. Oh, and then th on the aisle. Hi, Senator. Uh, thank you for your service. I'm Phil Schrafer. I'm a retired international health care worker and spent three years in active duty in the Marine Corps. Uh, the complexity of Iran. Um, I believe General Mattis actually thought that we should have stayed in the nuclear agreement. I believe I've never heard Rouhani or the foreign minister say anything about death to America. Way back, Ahmadinejad said something about death to Americans. But so I, I don't know where that where that comes from. I mean, is it more of a Shiite Sunni struggle? That not that part of the complex? It is part of the complex as well. Again, going back to that very same web that we've been talking about, there are so many different interests, so many different factions, so many different groups, and they're all competing um, to be that alpha leader. Uh, so it, it is very complex, and the nuclear agreement is another level or layer of complexity now with Iran as well. So we do have a number of international partners that are still engaging, and the United States now is not. So again, finding our way forward and working between Congress, the administration, Department of, of Defense, uh, we have to speak with one voice, and we have to work with our international partners as well to find a path forward. Um, the path forward is not clear. It is not clear. And last question, yeah. Senator, thank you very much. Jeff Selden from VOA. You mentioned uh, earlier the lack of focus on U.S. troops in Iraq, in, in Syria, in Afghanistan. Do you think leaders at the Pentagon, like Secretary Mattis, need to be more vocal and visible? And also, very quickly, how effective do you think Russia's been in picking off U.S. allies across that part of the world? Well, to the, the first point, um, having certain leaders be more vocal and, and visible, I, if we could clone Secretary Mattis, I think we could make him a lot more visible and, and vocal. Um, if you look around, around the globe with what we have with North Korea, with, um, with Russia, I mean, there are just so many other areas of interest right now that he is also working on. So I wish we had, I do wish we had more of him. Uh, because he is a very good communicator. And 
I think we need to raise the level of Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, and we need to keep that out in the news so people are paying attention and so that we do have the support of the American people. Um, unfortunately, we can't clone Secretary Mattis, so <laughs> we have got to find other leaders that are going to inspire out there as well. So that will fall on some of us that are in the United States Senate, in the House, uh, other leaders throughout the DOD that can be a, kind of a voice of reason out there as well. So that's that, that piece. We just have to have the right people inspiring others. Um, as far as Russia picking up uh, or picking off our allies in the region, is that they, they make some interesting promises, and, and we know they try and, you know, voice their, their systems off, their military systems off on, on folks in that region, too, and they make big promises. Uh, but I think the partner of choice is the United States of America. And many of those countries will understand, and many of those groups will understand, that if you are working with the United States, there is an opportunity for peace in the future. There is an opportunity to advance. There is an opportunity to align yourself with the West. Um, if they choose Russia, they go on a totally different path. And again, the partner of choice would be the United States of America. There's just so much more opportunity presented by partnering with the United States. Senator, I know you have a busy day on the Hill. Uh, we thank you for taking the time to come down and talk to us about this issue. Um, I want to really thank you for the strategic focus that you bring on this critical issue, as well as so much heart and humanity that you bring to the conversation. Um, we thank you for being up there, working this hard. Thank you for joining us this morning. Please thank join me in thanking out. Senator Hughes.